Reacts, and this is the origins of Russian authoritarianism by the channel Kraut. Yeah, okay. Authoritarianism. <laughs> I guess it goes uh, back to the Ivan the Terrible, right? I'm pretty sure I remember watching some videos from my Big Usher TV and yeah, Ivan the Terrible uh, changed a lot of things. I guess it must have been around that time, but I don't know. This was the channel Kraut. I think I've seen one or two videos of Kraut in the past. I don't remember exactly. But I do remember that, you know, that's where I saw the first the country balls things, right? Because this channel does country balls type of animation. But yeah. Alright, let's watch it. Remember if you like my reaction, don't forget to subscribe. So I know which type of videos to react to more. Check out the Rick Sunday, there's a link in the season. And yeah, let's watch it. Before we get into this video, I would like to inform you that this video is sponsored by Keeps. Keeps is a men's health subscription service that provides men with wide-ranging services and products to prevent hair loss. Two out of three men suffer from hair loss, and the best way to combat it is to do something about it while you still have hair. With Keeps, a licensed doctor will review your information online and build a treatment plan for you. Your shipments of treatment products will then be sent to you every three months. Your doctor will also be available for you via chat 24 hours a day for seven days a week. The reviews of their products and services are widely positive and you can check them as well as the before and after reports out yourself if you wish to convince yourself of their products and services first. Prevention is key to preventing hair loss and if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss yourself, you can go to keeps.com slash crowd or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's keeps.com slash crowd. Many thanks to Keeps for sponsoring this video. And now, let's get into it. Nomadic empires were some of the most fascinating entities in human history. Mm. Originating from the steppes of Central Asia, most lived in isolation, unbothered by neighboring empires who saw their lands as worthless. This isolation allowed many nomadic tribes to specialize increasingly in nomadic life and warfare, competing with other tribes in a continuous struggle that in a survival of the fittest way resulted in ever proficient warrior tribes. The Huns. Once every few centuries they ventured forth from their steppes to overrun and conquer settled societies that were ill prepared to face them. However, as efficient and near unbeatable as these nomadic peoples were in their conquests, a curious thing about them was that once they settled in the lands they had conquered, the nomads turned into what they had conquered. The Magyar tribes conquered Pannonia and turned into the Hungarian Kingdom. The Slavic tribes conquered Eastern Europe and turned into the Slavic Kingdoms. The Seljuk Turks conquered Iran and became the new Iranian Empire. The Ottoman Turks conquered Anatolia and became the new Romans. The Chagatai Turks conquered India and became the Indians. The Mongols conquered Iran and became the new Iranian Empire. And when the Mongols conquered China, they became the new Chinese Empire. There is, however, one big exception in this series of historic conquest by <laughs> nomadic peoples and their consequent social restructuring. Russia. Medieval Russia was not that much different from many other medieval European Yeah, okay. First of all, the that's interesting, right? The nomadic tribe. Obviously, uh, they were great at... Uh, first of all, they're, you know... What, what, what is it called that, you know, uh, basically they attack on horsebacks, right? Attacks and then disappears, then attacks again. What their strategy is, I, I don't remember. But Huns ha did the same thing, so did the Mongols, right? So, uh, I guess nomadic tribes were great at conquering. I guess that's how they lived, right? But obviously their systems were not as great as the others. So, when they conquered the places and saw how they worked, eventually they became them, right? And uh, adopted that system or something and became, you know, I guess, their own empire there. States at the time, a collection of small duchies, cities and dukedoms with no centralized overarching authority. The most prominent among these were the Kievan Rus and the Novgorod Republic. The Kievan Rus was a princely state with deep cultural and commercial ties into Europe, mainly through the Byzantines. The Novgorod Republic was a city-state and an important part of the Hanseatic League of Cities that stretched across the Baltic and North Sea. Then came the Mongols. The end of the Mongols. There's a tendency amongst modern historians to paint the Mongol Empire in a positive light as an institution of trade and tolerance, which, though, is very oversimplified and overlooks the fact that the Mongol Empire was an extractive institution. The Mongols were a tribal people who had no state or legal structures that they transferred over to the people they conquered. 
Their relation with those they conquered was purely predatory. They wanted to extract wealth and resources from them, and those who refused paid dearly. The Kievan Rus was one of these places that resisted. Kiev was burnt to the ground and the surrounding lands pillaged. I mean, I've seen some of the, you know, Mongol videos, I guess was one of extra credits or something. And in those videos, I made certain comments, and there's always some people that are like, hmm, it was not, it was, uh, you know, more complex than that. It was more, you know, advanced. They had a proper system. It was a different time. There's always this kind of people who try to, you know, I guess, play around around that kind of a point that he just said. But uh, <laughs> uh, the main thing here is that it was a tribal time, right? A crowd said it the best here. Like, they were very predatory. Whenever they conquer something, all they wanted is their shit, right? Wherever they conquered, they just wanted to bleed them dry. There's a reason why there are many places around the world right now that are empty because Mongol burned it to the ground. What that story is that uh, Genghis Khan's, uh, what, daughters, uh, something, somebody insulted somebody and basically he just burned the fucking entire town down with no survivors. I mean, this is what we are talking about, right? So there was always some apologetic, like, you know, no, it wasn't, it was more complex. They, they were, uh, you know, uh, even though they were barbaric, they had a proper system. They said that they weren't that barbaric. It was uh, at the, t the time was different. No, not really. Right. Because we can see the history far back as Byzantium, Romans, right, G uh, Greek Empire. And nobody was barbaric as Genghis Khan and the Mongols. With much of the population slaughtered. Medieval accounts tell us of fields filled with human remains for decades after the siege. Oh, God. With the burning of Kiev, a substantial political and cultural transformation of what we now know as Russia began. The Kievan Rus, with its deep cultural and economic ties to the Byzantians, had been the cultural motherland and birthplace of Russia. I guess this is where one of the video uh, of uh, History Matters, where Russia said we are going to be the third Rome or something because of the ties to Byzantine empires, huh? place where Russia as a European cultural entity had been created. All that was left of it now was ash. The cultural and economic ties with the Byzantians were now broken. This resulted in a geopolitical shift of Russia, culturally and politically, in power to the northeast. The Mongols enforced their economic order upon the remaining Russian principality states and the center of Russian political and economic power consequently shifted to the landlocked plains of Smolensk, Rostov and Chernikov. These places and the princes who ruled them had been largely ignored backwaters before the Mongols. Now they stood at the center of Russia. Throughout the rest of Europe, the institution of feudalism had during this time started to be increasingly challenged. New political and commercial institutions evolved in European trade cities, from Antwerp to Hamburg to Königsberg, Warsaw, Paris, Lisbon, London and Venice. Merchants, barons and artists and guilds rewrote the feudal social contract. Additionally, the Black Plague shook up the economic framework of Europe dramatically. With a third of Europe's population killed, there were no longer enough peasants to work the lands for lords. Landlords consequently started competing for the remaining peasants by offering them payment for work. Previously, peasants had worked in exchange for a promise of protection that now became increasingly replaced by a wage-based mm. labor system. But Russia remained untouched by these political and economic developments. It remained under... So basically, it was like, you have land, but you have nobody to protect, basically. So we are going to... Basically, I'm the baron here, right? I'm going to create forts. I'm going to create security. I'm going to, you know, make sure everything's at peace, right? And you work for me. Obviously, you are, you know, <laughs> you're a farmer. So you have food to it, right? But uh, there's not going to be any payment. It's just going to be protection. You can kind of see where they're coming from. Because before that, it would have been like, you know, just danger from all sides or type of thing. This was more secure, like it feels like living inside a city wall or something. Mongol rule for 250 years and went into an entirely different direction. The princes of central Russia were recruited by the Mongols as tax collectors. The Mongols outsourced the process of extracting the resource they wanted out of the Russian peasantry to the Russian princes. Because that aristocracy had a lot to lose if they failed to appease their Mongol overlords, and because the Mongols had brought no legal code of limited aristocratic power, the Russian princes extracted that wealth with increasing unopposed ruthlessness and brutality. 
Mm. While in Europe, feudalism increasingly disbanded, an increasingly exploitative economic framework was reinforced in Russia. Urbanization didn't take place as it did in Europe, with the Russian princes invested in keeping as many peasants working the lands as possible. The Russian princes recruited armies of cavalrymen who were paid not in money, but in land, and the peasants on it. However, because there was so much land, control of the land was not as important as control of the people. While in Europe, peasants gained access to wages and left for cities to escape feudal lords, in Russia, the peasants became deeper tied into their land through strict rules tying them to it, debt patronage, and brutal Damn. punishments for attempting to flee. The Black Plague had the opposite socio-economic outcome in Russia compared to Europe. While in Europe, lords started competing for peasants by paying them wages, the Russian princes used the plague to tie lands into enormous duchies and fiefdoms under a smaller number of lords, creating an enormous peasantry working the lands of an extremely small aristocracy. When nomads conquered a settled people, they usually turned into who they conquered. But here, in a weird twist, the conquered Russians almost became Mongols. They were unshackled from any and all political accountability to their peasantry and could rule like the conquerors whom they served. But because the Russian princes merely mm. served the Mongols and were not Mongols themselves, they didn't adopt the tribal customs and nomadic lifestyle of them. The power structure of the Russian princely states thereby became heavily centralized within the power of a singular ruler figure of a state. The Russian princes even adopted the warfare tactics of their conquerors. Rather than build stone castles as the rest of Europe did, they built wooden fortresses and recruited large cavalry armies. When they were invaded, they burnt the wooden castles down, ransacked and burnt. Huh. So basically Russian authoritarianism comes from Mongols and Mongols only outsources to the Russian princes. That's where everything started, right? I mean, Russian pr princes basically saw that, well, first of all, we can't piss off the Mongols. And doing this is kind of sweet. We are getting more richer and it just, you know, we're just tying more and more people to us, basically. That's really fucked up, man. Burnt the fields of their own land and then harassed invaders from horseback while those invaders were forced to march through and suffer the vastness of Russia. The Russians also missed out on a key development in European political yeah, development right, yeah. at the time, where a move away from decentralized feudalism into centralized absolutist kingdoms took place, creating the first large and powerful centralized European states. Over the 250 years of Mongol rule, with the shift from Kiev and Novgorod to central Russia, and an economic development away from commerce and artisans to a peasant economy, the most powerful Russian princely state to emerge was the Duchy of Moscow which would eventually be the one to rise up in rebellion and kick the Mongols out to create a new Russian state centered mm. around Moscow. But with the Mongols gone, the newly independent Russia kept the socio-economic and political structures that had developed under Mongol rule and strengthened them. Absolutism is a system of governments in which all political power lies within one singular ruler. Beginning in the 1500s, many a European monarchy embarked on efforts to construct absolutist states, most famously France. It is during this time that the foundations of the modern nation-state were laid, but the absolutism project in general was rather unsuccessful. The French monarchs drove the state into bankruptcy and ended up selling government offices and thereby state power to the highest bidders. The steward did dynasty attempts to build absolutism in Britain ended with their expulsion. Throughout Europe, urban populations, lower gentry and merchants had made the establishment of the all-powerful state difficult. But the conditions found in Russia allowed the Russian Tsars to create a near-perfect absolutism. There are three main factors that led to this. First, Russian society after Mongol rule consisted of a monarch, the army the monarch paid with land, an aristocracy of boyars, and a peasantry. A key difference to other parts of Europe was that the army was not incorporated within the aristocratic class. The army had been directly recruited by the Muscovite state and was mm. dependent upon that state for its status and pay. The state, and thereby the monarch, could use the army without constraints by any aristocrats, even against those aristocrats. Damn, all right. So their system, they were kind of started during the Mongol rule, 
Uh, they saw that hmm, this is pretty sweet system. So absolutism that comes from that, right? Like state is gonna have uh, the military because I'm the one who's paying you in, uh, you know, all the land and shit. Uh, all the aristocrats is gonna be below them, peasants below them. The whole system basically, uh, state is the uh, main power all around, right? With everybody else having close to no power. Damn. Of course, system like this when it starts to rise up in, I guess, Britain and basically everywhere. There's gonna be like fuck that we are not having that. But of course, people are gonna go like that, because the, there the system already is uh, was with the nobles and aristocrats, right? They were already implemented that. And if you're gonna start that this new system, right? Of course, all of those people are gonna oppose them. Like you wanna kick us out of power? Come on. Second, Russia didn't experience the regionalized feudal social structures that the rest of Europe did. In fact, there is debate among historians if Russia experienced medieval feudalism at all. Medieval feudalism was a social system in which a peasantry submitted to a military lord and his castle mm. in exchange for protection. In Russia, though, the regionalized structure of aristocracy didn't exist. There were no castles offering protection in these vast lands, and military power lay with the state. The new Moscovite state also introduced the Mestinestvo, a system of hierarchies amongst lesser nobles that pitted them up against each other in competition for the favor of the monarch. In Europe, the lower aristocracy had an important role in the creation of parliamentary structures by forming a political bloc, competing with the king for concessions, privileges, rights and powers. In Russia, all power remained yeah. with the monarch, and the aristocracy was set up to compete with each other for the favor of the monarch. Third, that's the thing. If you if you're gonna tell like in London, basically in Britain, France, everywhere that you know, aristocrats has no power now. It's all power to the states. Of course, they're not gonna go for it because uh, the system is not there. While in Russia, because of the Mongols, system was kind kind of already was developing like that. So they were in that position to become this. Law developed differently in Russia to the rest of Europe. One of the key factors in the development of law in Europe had been the Catholic Church. It established almost state-like oh, yeah. structures that competed with monarchs for authority, creating standards for accountability that evolved into written codes of law. Kings of Europe could not just do as they pleased to their subjects or their aristocracy. Violating the standards set by the Catholic Church resulted in harsh condemnation and punishment by the Church. Medieval feudalism was not a mere exploitative social framework. It was a religious social order under which systems of accountability were created by religion that limited the power of the state. The Russian church was derived from the Byzantines, and the Eastern Orthodox Church was Caesiopapist, meaning that the head of the church was appointed by the monarch. The Christian church as it came to develop in Russia was an institution subservient to the state and continued to be throughout history be it to kings, emperors, communist party bosses, or today's oligarchs. The completion of the Russian absolutist state occurred in the late 1500s under Tsar Ivan IV. He established uh, a Mr. military Terrible. district with absolute powers to himself called the Oprishnina and inflicted a decade-long reign of terror upon the country. Ivan had asked the aristocracy permission for this <laughs> undertaking and they had approved, which goes to asked. show how little the Russian aristocracy could do or even wanted to do to limit the power of the monarch, even though Ivan's reign of terror would come at an enormous cost to them. Of the many aristocratic families of Russia, only nine survived this reign of terror. This all right, first of all, I understand during the Mongol times this kind of worked, but after that, right, during the especially the time of Ivan the Terrible, what I understand, this might be a very simplistic way of seeing things, but I don't understand is like, here's a simple basis of things, right? Here's one guy, one state, right, emperor, king, whatever, who has absolute power with nobody else having any power, right? But uh, what I understand is how these aristocrats and the military generals or military leader in the background doesn't conspire or create a coup because this one guy has all the fucking power. We, we're not going to have that because that's what happens when some one guy has way too much power. Throw the history, that will happen. People have brain, right? Then, oh, this is the law now. I have all the power. I have all the military. You don't get shit. It's just the law. See, it's written here. That's not going to work. That right? military is going to have their own generals, uh, you know, commanders or whatever, key people. How are they not conspiring with, uh, you know, 
aristocrats, nobles or whatever to just, you know, overthrow the current system, right? So that's surprising. State structure of absolute unrestricted power within the monarch continued after Ivan, including with the establishment of this is the surprising. Romanov dynasty in 1613. And it is not difficult to see it continuing throughout the history of modern Russia. You can see the slavish capitulation of the Russian aristocracy to Ivan's reign of terror almost reflected in the capitulation of the Soviet Politburo to Stalin's reign of terror. And you can browse through the list of murdered Russian journalists yourself to see that in many ways Russia remains a country in which state power puts the ruling man above the law and removes them from any accountability to the law or the wider citizenry. A mistake of and we are wondering right now why that person has the balls to do what he's doing right now right if this is the mindset where the person is living like i have the absolute power right i mean come on it does recent event really surprise you made though is to assume that these developments were unavoidable and somehow part of some inner logic of Russian culture itself. The city of Novgorod continued to prosper and was never conquered by the Mongols. Its institutions developed to have more in common with those of European city-states. It was the gateway for European goods into Russia and Russian goods into Europe, which made it incredibly rich. The prince of Novgorod may have commanded an army, but he was accountable to the Vecce, a parliament of the city that all free men of the city voted voted for and which picked a mayor from the city aristocracy. The Vecce and the mayor had control over taxation, laws and foreign policy. It even had the power to remove the prince of Novgorod <laughs> from power Damn. to replace him with another. There was a different Russian political development which evolved Seriously, to have completely opposite. And balances as well as state accountability and rule of law. But that development ended when Ivan III conquered Novgorod, had its leaders executed and its merchants and aristocrats deported to the deep plains of central Russia. One can only imagine what modern Russia would look like if the free city <laughs> of on. Novgorod had been its founding structure instead of the Tsardom of Moscow. All right, seriously, I like alternate history. It's a fun <laughs> experiment to do. But let's be honest, what would happen if this hadn't happened? But that that did happen, right? <laughs> so basically, what if some guy like Ivan didn't come there and just destroy the system? Yeah, eventually someone would have, right? Because it did. It's not very easy to say, what, what if this system would have survived? That system was harming the past of what happened in Russia. So somebody even you like Russia has been you know like this or the state has all the power type of thing. Why the fuck would I you know uh, you know bow down to all these other people with this new system? Somebody eventually would have gotten the idea to attack and just destroy the system like I went did there. Moscow. The only other Russian representative body was the Zemsky Zabor, a council of aristocrats that gathered to do little more but approve the line of succession to the throne and approve of the Tsar's wars, until Peter the Great even took those powers away from it. Meanwhile in the rest of Europe, parliamentary assemblies, which in some cases were as old as the Middle Ages, started gaining more and more power from monarchs, establishing parliamentary political institutions and traditions throughout Europe. In Russia, there was no parliamentary institution until the establishment of the Duma in 1906, which oh, had yeah. its powers taken from go. it by the Tsar again only a few years later. And he did that in a way that people were pissed off. was far more centralized than any of its European counterparts, but far more underdeveloped in economy and bureaucracy. There were no regional political structures tied in accountability to a central state. Instead, rule of local provinces was handed out by the Tsar in so-called Kormlinje, which means feedings. And the name kind of gives away the predatory nature of the political institution itself. Local rulers had no accountability to law either, and no restraints on how much they could exploit the office for personal gain, as long Damn. as they managed to appease the centralized government. When you look closer at the previously mentioned list of murdered Russian journalists, you will notice how most are regional reporters in small towns who were investigating the corruption of a local police department or mayor. What's more is that this practice of regional corruption remained in place despite being reformed by Peter the Great. 
state, who instituted a standardized system of regionalized government which recruited the aristocracy as local servants to the state. A reason for this may be found in that the new system rewarded successful local governors with tax exemptions, thereby incentivizing the aristocracy to squeeze the peasantry even harder in certain- Peter the Great not so much great apparently, that's what I'm finding, damn. I mean, you could argue that how he could have seen that coming, I mean, sure, but, okay. One thing that surprised me, how did it take like 1900s for revolution to start in Russia? The, the way things has been going since the Mongols times, like 1200s, 1300s, there should have been like multiple revolutions, right? Not very recently, like the Soviet that we know of. Because people in mass basically, you know, uh, living under this kind of a bad condition where... Your local ruler has no accountability. I mean, in the end, people will be like, we, we have the more number, right? Military is also made of us, you know, just uh, just create some kind of coup in the background or something. Just it's Some kind of a revolution would have happened. Even the failed one, but at least some revolution would have happened. It's surprising that it didn't. Especially at the start of things where state had all the power because of the, you know, how it developed during the Mongol time, right? So state had all the power. That, that is one of the biggest time where some kind of a coup happens. Because aristocrats would have been like, we have no power, fuck you. Just you know, conspire with the military. And I'm surprised that it didn't happen. ...service of the state and themselves. A legacy of Peter the Great's reforms was that the tax burden of the state was increasingly placed upon the Russian peasantry while the aristocracy ah. were increasingly exempt. In Damn. modern Russia, you will find an enormous contrast between the wealth of the oligarchs and your average Russian pensioner, whose pension is barely enough to sustain him. In many ways, it has been a common thread throughout Russian history since the 1700s that the burden of securing the state and the ambitions of wealth of its ruler have been dumped upon the Russian peasantry, from the trenches to the gulags to today's pension and social security cuts. An additional aspect of Peter the Great's reforms were the introduction of severe punishments for serfs who left their lands. Damn. Also All right. One thing that only only point I can think about this is that throughout the Russian history, one thing has been the point like Russia as a nation is only the you know Russian state, not the people, right? When we think of a country, we think of a, you know people in it, right? Like uh, you know. People of Russia, that is Russia, right? I mean, uh, if Russian people suffer, that's not really good look. While I think throughout the history, in uh, especially Russian history, the uh, thinking that I've always been that people in power is what represents Russia, is what's going to drive the Russia as a power forward, and everybody peasant and people don't matter. That these are just a cog as a machine to put Russia forward and put it on the map or something like that. That's why, uh, you know, all the decision made by anyone throughout the history in Russia has always been like harsher on the poor people, harsher on the peasants, while it always benefits the people in power or, you know, aristocrats, the, you know, the emperor or whatever. Because there has to be some kind of a, you know, philosophy in order to make this kind of decision. And I think that's what that was, that people is not Russia. The, the Russian state, right, is what Russia is. Everything is just cog in a machine. So for regional rulers and aristocrats who granted more freedoms to serfs and peasants and thereby incited competition with other regional rulers. This bound the rulers of Russia on a regional level even closer together to cooperate in their exploitative economic structure and tied them deeper to the centralized state. Everyone was now tied together in this, and nobody could take the risk of stepping out of line. Centuries later, those Communist Party members who may have disagreed with the Communist Politburo on something found themselves shot, and today those What the fuck? <laughs> oh my god, here comes the painting in... <laughs> I've never seen an actual painting where Stalin did that shit, I always heard of it. This is, there you go. Politburo on something found themselves shot. Oh, you can't even see the smidging there. What the fuck it did? <laughs> How did he paint that bad? That's some nice Photoshop. <laughs> 
Damn. And today, those oligarchs who step out of line with the central government find themselves dispossessed, jailed, or murdered. Russian absolutism was founded on an alliance between the central ruler of the state and the rulers of the various subdivisions of the state to enrich themselves at the expense of everyone else. It is why Russia never had a bourgeoisie, a small business mittelstand, commercial trader class, or any resemblance of equality before the law and public accountability. As the historian John Delon described it, The Russian government, more than any other, was a government of men and not of laws. And that aspect of Russian absolutism is what makes it so unique. To show why we can compare Russia to another absolutist state, China, which also underwent a century-long political development that resulted in a powerful, centralized state institution with absolute power and a lack of public accountability. Bought but you will find a very big difference between the two. Chinese absolutism was built on a foundation of meritocracy in competition with patrimonialism. Chinese rulers continuously found themselves in positions of having to abide by some standards of accountability to a state bureaucracy. China has, just as Russia, gone through periods of incredible abuse of power, from the Empress Wu to the Great Leap Forward to the Cultural Revolution. But all these periods resulted in reshuffling and restructuring of the political leadership to not repeat mistakes. Mao Zedong had to step down from the Politburo after his Great Leap Forward caused the Great Chinese Famine, and only regained political power through a populist coup with the Cultural Revolution. And that populism was something the Chinese state consequently cracked down upon after Mao's death. Mm. Just as in Russia, the state is absolute in China. If you wish to protest against a decision by the state or change the course of the state, you have to go through the institutions of You'll see the a state. Tank. And just as in Russia, you will find corruption and abuse of power in China, such as local governments that cover up the selling of poisonous baby formula. But the poisonous baby formula. What the fuck? Structure becomes very clear when you compare abuse of power and corruption. In China, the further you go up in ranks of government, the less corrupt state officials become as a result of the meritocratic state structures. Mm. In Russia, the further you go up in the ranks of government, the more corrupt state officials become, as there are no systems of accountability. The only measure in restraint is that you can't be corrupt enough as a local Russian politician to start bothering and annoying your superior politician which is why the government becomes more corrupt the higher the office of the state is. Yeah, the okay, Russian that... state is a system of progressively corrupting power. Yeah, that's what the system has become, right? If your whole system is based on that, like corruption and you know no accountability, no shit, the more upper, yeah, there's a reason why Putin has way too many billions. I mean, what was the measure there that he has way too many billions, uh, you know, with him or something? Damn. In the next video, we will be comparing China and India, more specifically Damn. the millennia-long developments in politics and society that created such different and even opposing state structures. Okay, did you do that? This video is kind of old now. It's a year old. I don't know. I'll have to check the channel. But yeah, this is the uh, only thing I can think of is what I said, like, you know, the whole Russian, you know, I guess philosophy must be that Russian state is what Russia is rather than Russian people. So Russian people don't matter. They can suffer, right? These are, these are just cogs in the machine. Or a Russian state and people in power, aristocrats, uh, king, emperors, th these are the only people who matter in order for Russia to be, you know, something in the global standing or something. There must be some kind of philosophy like that. Otherwise, uh, you can't really see something like this happening for centuries if there is no core philosophy behind it. But yeah, but I'm surprised that there was no revolution until the Soviet one for centuries. That is a surprising one. But yeah. Probably well, that was Origins of Russian Authoritarianism by the channel Kraut. I like the Kraut channel. I think I've seen one or two videos. Like I said, I have to check the channel. Way too many videos on my channel. I don't know how to check it if I did it or not. But yeah. Alright. I'll see you next time.